Statistical mirror symmetry is a duality between two geometric structures on the tangent bundle of certain statistical manifolds. The goal of this talk is to give an introduction to the subject, and we'll focus on a particularly important example, which comes from the family of normal distributions. For an overview of what I'm going to talk about, I'll start by giving some background on information geometry and the family of normal distributions. Then I'll show you the construction of statistical mirror symmetry and discuss how this relates to mirror symmetry of kawabe yau manifolds. Then I'll discuss the spaces which show up when we apply statistical mirror symmetry to normal distributions. And finally, I'll finish off with two applications, one of which is a conjecture in number theory, and the other of which is a result in Kilo-Ritchie flow. For more details, you can refer to the following two papers by Professor Zhuin Zhang and myself. For all of the references in this talk, there'll be QR codes. So you can take out your phone, take a picture, and it will take you to the reference. OK, let's give some background on information geometry. Information geometry studies parameterized families of probability distributions from a geometric perspective. In other words, if we have a parameterized family, p of x given theta, so here x is a point in the sample space, p is a probability, either a density or a probability mass, and theta is a parameter. Well, what we do is we consider the space of all possible theta values, the whole set of possible parameters, and the collection of those forms a statistical manifold. Here, what I've pictured are multinomial distributions. So there's three events, and each of one them has a different probability of occurring. And by changing the probabilities of these events, we get a different multinomial distribution. It turns out that from the perspective of information geometry, the space of multinomial distributions is a positive orthant of a sphere. But we're, in this talk, we're not really going to talk about multinomial distributions. We're really going to focus on normal distributions. Normal distributions are some of the most important distributions, both in statistics as well as information geometry. And they're given by the following PDF. And what you'll note here is that there's two parameters, mu and sigma. And what that means is that the space of normal distributions is a two-dimensional statistical manifold. The mean mu specifies where the distribution is centered, and the variance sigma tells you how spread out or concentrated the distribution is. And intuitively, changing the parameters affects the distribution much more drastically when the variance is small, when the distribution is very concentrated. Those initial distributions are very different. They have very little overlap. But if I increase the variance and have the distribution spread out, well, these distributions are very similar. And we want some way to make that idea precise in terms of information geometry. Well, it turns out that for any parameterized family of probability distributions, so not just the normal family, this works in general, we can consider the following quantity, which is known as the Fisher metric. Well, it's actually a matrix, and the way that we compute this matrix is that we take our probability density function, or probability mass function, we take the log of that and we differentiate it with respect to the parameters. And then we compute this integral, and if this were a probability mass function, it would actually be a sum rather than an integral. And now we get a matrix in the, uh, with indexes j, k, because we have to do this for any pair of parameters. Well, it turns out that this matrix depends smoothly on the point of the parameter space. And so it's actually a Riemannian metric. It's positive, definite, and symmetric. And from this, we can compute distances between points in the parameter space. We can compute angles, volumes, curvatures, all sorts of geometric information. I'm not going to discuss where the Fisher metric actually comes from. You can think of it as the second order Taylor polynomial, 
of the relative entropy between distributions. So the takeaway is it has roots in information theory, but the justification for how you get the specific quantity is not important for this talk. Okay, let's actually compute the Fisher metric for normal distributions. Well, there's four components, I'm just gonna compute one of them. And to compute the g mu mu component, we just take this expression and we put in the Gaussian kernel, and that's a gigantic mess, but we're just gonna start simplifying it. Okay, so we can combine those two together, and now we have something that looks like this. Now we just need to take the derivatives of that term. Okay, we can do that. Uh, this is looking simpler. Now we're gonna do a u substitution to center the distribution, get rid of that x minus mu. And now we have something which simplifies quite nicely because I can pull out that one over sigma to the fourth out of the integral. And now this, I know how to integrate because I know what the second moment of a Gaussian distribution is. And so when I go and I compute the g mu mu component of the Fisher metric, I get one over sigma squared. Okay, now there's three more uh, components to compute, well really only two because the metric is symmetric, so I still need to do the g sigma sigma and the g sigma mu component, but when I do that I get the following expression. And this should look familiar because it's the Poincaré half-point model for hyperbolic space. Okay, I've got to ignore that factor of two on the d sigma squared term and the way to do that is to just rescale the variance, to take the variance and divide it by square root of two, and that just changes coordinates for the statistical manifold so it doesn't have any geometric um, effect at all. Okay, so changing the mean and the variance affects the distribution much more drastically when the variance is small, and this phenomena induces the normal family with hyperbolic geometry. Just as an example, the first pair of normal distributions are much further apart than the second pair of normal distributions because the first pair has much larger variance than the second pair. So this is a way to make precise the idea that was coming from before. Okay, well in information geometry and in statistics, there's more than one way to think about the normal family. We can also think of it as an exponential family. So an exponential family is a family of probability distributions which are parameterized in the following way. They have this form of parameterization. And if we write it in this form, the parameters eta are known as natural parameters and the function a of eta is known as the log partition function. Exponential families were originally studied in statistics because they're a class of parameterized families which can be analyzed very concretely. And many of the computations that statisticians need to do simplify quite a bit if you have an exponential family. As we'll see, in, uh, in information geometry, exponential families also simplify many of the computations. Okay, so let's consider the family of normal distributions as an exponential family. To do this, we're going to need to again rewrite the PDF of the normal family. So we've got some algebra to do, but it's just algebra, it's not too bad, and we've got it into the form that we want. So when we do that, the sufficient statistics, eta1 and eta2, are the following, and then we have theta1 and theta2, which are functions of the points in the sample space, and they're the following. And, okay, now this final term is our log partition function, but we want to rewrite that in terms of eta1 and eta2. And when we do that, we get the following. Okay, so the reason to do this is that there's a very simple formula for the Fisher metric of an exponential family 
when we write it in terms of the natural parameters. And that formula is, we just take our log partition function and we take its second derivative. We take the Hessian matrix. And that gives us our Fisher metric. Okay, technically I'm being a little bit sloppy here because the Fisher metric is a Riemannian metric and I've written it as a matrix. But the way to think about it is that the components of the matrix are the components of the Riemannian metric. Also, it's not immediately clear that this metric is hyperbolic if you look at this expression, but the way that we got this is just by changing coordinates from the standard half-plane model. So this is a hyperbolic metric, and you could verify that if you computed the scalar curvature. This is an example of something known as a Hessian metric because the Riemannian metric is given by the Hessian of a convex function. And Here's a pretty good reference on the geometry of Hessian structures, which is a central focus of information geometry. Well, it turns out that there's not just one way to write an exponential family as a Hessian metric. There's also a dual parameterization. So what we're going to do for this is we're going to take those theta 1 and theta 2 quantities, and we're going to take a particular normal distribution and take the expected value of theta 1 and theta 2. And doing that, we get u1 is equal to mu, and u2 is equal to mu squared plus sigma squared. Note here that we have that u2 has got to be bigger than u1 squared, just from looking at the formulas for them. And the reason that we do this is that we get another set of coordinates for our statistical manifold, and these coordinates also satisfy a Hessian metric um, condition. But here what we do is instead of taking the Hessian of the log partition function, we take the Hessian of the Legendre transform of the log partition function. So the formula for the Legendre transform is given there. I'm not going to drive what it is. I'll just tell you the final answer. That's the Legendre transform of the log partition function. And again, we can compute what this is, and we get the following expression for the Fisher metric. And again, this is a metric of constant negative curvature, which just comes from the fact that we got it by changing coordinates. OK, let me tell you how to take this and build a Kähler metric from what we're going to do is we're going to take this open set where u2 is greater than u1 squared, that's the domain on which we have, and we are going to consider the tangent bundle of this space, so the collection of all possible tangent vectors. And it turns out that if we have coordinates on a space, then there's some natural coordinates on the tangent bundle. And the basic idea is that we take a tangent vector and we re uh, rewrite it as a linear combination of partial derivatives with respect to the coordinates. So the precise definition of these natural coordinates is not terribly important, but the idea is that if we have coordinates on our underlying space, we have a nice way to write coordinates for the fibers in the tangent bundle. All right. Let's change our perspective a little bit. We're going to take this manifold, which is a Hessian manifold, and we are going to consider its tangent bundle now in terms of the complex coordinate, u plus iv, where v were those natural coordinates on the tangent bundle from before. And when we do this, this gives the space the structure of a tube domain in C2. So it's a tube because it, you know, we have this convex space and it just extends infinitely off in both upwards and downwards in C2. And we can then define a killer metric on this by taking our A star potential and extending it so that it's independent of how high we are up in the tube domain and then just defining omega to be I dd bar of this potential. 
It turns out that this is a Kaler metric. It's compatible with the induced complex structure. And this is an example of something known as the Sasaki metric. Now, there are ways to do this where I don't rely on a coordinate expression for what I have. Right now, I'm using the fact that I have the U1 and U2. Those are known as the sufficient statistics. But I can do this more generally and in a more canonical way if I use the dually flat structure of a Hessian metric. And here's a good reference on how to do that. For the rest of this talk, I'm not going to focus on that. I'll use the fact that we have these nice coordinates that we're working with. Well, it turns out that's one killer metric, but in fact, I could have done the same exact construction just using the natural parameters and the log partition function. So instead of using the sufficient statistics and the Legendre transform of the log partition function, just use the other parameterization. And doing so, I would have gotten another Kähler manifold. And so this is the definition of statistical mirror symmetry. If we start with a Hessian manifold with its dually flat structure, Statistical mirror symmetry is the duality between the two Kähler manifolds which we construct in this way. Okay, so mirror symmetry is already a thing, so I should tell you what the relationship between statistical mirror symmetry is and mirror symmetry in order to justify where the name comes from. In order to do so, I'm going to assume some familiarity with the geometry of Calabi-Yau manifolds. So if this is something new, feel free to tune out this part and come back to it in the next part of the talk. OK. In algebraic geometry and string theory, mirror symmetry is a complex to symplectic duality between Calabi-Yau manifolds. In other words, two distinct Calabi-Yau manifolds, two different Calabi-Yau manifolds, have closely related geometry. So just as an example, if we have a quintic threefold, well, that's a kind of canonical example of a Clavier manifold, there's going to be a mirror manifold whose geometry is different from the original quintic threefold, but closely related. And the idea is that the complex geometry on one side has something to do with the symplectic geometry on the other. So here are two references which discuss mirror symmetry in the context of quintic threefolds, just to show how this works. Well, in general, mirror symmetry has the effect of rotating the Hodge diamond of the calabi yau manifold. So we have our calabi yau manifold, we have the Hodge diamond, which captures all the cohomology information, and then we just rotate that 90 degrees. And this isn't going to preserve the Hodge diamond, and what that means is that, in general, it's possible to tell the two clavi manifolds apart from their topology alone, not just their geometry. Also, they're going to be topologically distinct. The idea, though, is, as I said, the complex geometry on one side is closely related to the symplectic geometry on the other. So, in other words, there's numbers and quantities induced by the complex geometry on the primal clavi yau manifold that we can read off in terms of the symplectic geometry on the mirror side, and vice versa. And for two very important papers on the subject, there's the lecture by Konsevich, which describes how mirror symmetry affects the cohomology. And there's also this famous paper by Strominger, Zaslow, and Yao, which describes a conjectural recipe for how you build a uh, mirror symmetry. So it says that mirror symmetry should be closely related to t-duality. OK, going back to the definition of statistical mirror symmetry, well, let's start by imposing a condition on our potential. We're going to say that A satisfies the following mongen perry equation. And where this comes from is that we want the metric to be Ritchie flat. We want the Kähler metrics to be Ritchie flat, because that's what Clavier manifolds have. Yao showed that Clavier manifolds have a Ritchie flat metric. Well, it turns out that if A satisfies this particular mongen perry equation, then 
the which under transform will satisfy a closer weighted Montan Perry equation. And in this case, the Ricci curvatures of M and W both vanish because they're negative i dd bar of log dead omega, and log dead omega is just a constant. So we can think of this as imposing the Ricci flatness condition, which should come from the Clavier condition on the manifold. Okay, so now if we assume that the underlying Hessian manifold is compact because we want our Clavier manifolds to be compact, well, now we need to do something with the fibers because the fibers stick out infinitely um, up and down. So we're going to quotient the fibers of the primal space by some co-compact lattice. And then if we quotient the fibers of the dual space by the dual lattice, what we get are two Clavier manifolds in the usual sense, and these are mirror to each other in the space of Leung. So Leung has this paper called Mirror Symmetry Without Corrections, and this is exactly the construction from that paper. Well, it turns out that there's a theorem of Cheng and Yao that the only Clavier manifolds that you can get via this process by assuming Ricci flatness and imposing that the Hessian um, manifold is compact are going to be flat tori. So they're kind of trivial examples. So in order to find some interesting examples, we're going to drop the assumption of Ricci flatness and also drop the assumption that we have a compact base. Okay, well I should tell you the symplectic side of the story because traditionally speaking that's half the story in mirror symmetry. Well, with statistical mirror symmetry, both of the Kähler metrics are defined on the tangent bundle of a single Hessian metric. And what that means is that M and W are automatically diffeomorphic to each other. And furthermore, once you do the computation and you compute what the symplectic form is, it turns out that in both cases, the symplectic form is just the canonical symplectic form on the cotangent bundle. It agrees with that. And what that means is that M and W are automatically symplectomorphic, and we can write out it, their Darboux coordinates very explicitly, and find some canonical Lagrangian foliations. Well, the downside of that, though, is that statistical mirror symmetry is not particularly interesting from the perspective of symplectic geometry. As a duality, it's not, you know, there's nothing to it. So in order to convince you that this is something that we should look at, that this is an interesting thing, we really need to focus on the complex geometry, because that's where the interesting phenomena is going to appear. All right, so let's turn our attention back to normal distributions, and let's construct these spaces explicitly and see what happens. Well, we have this first space, and it turns out that this space has been studied quite a bit in several complex variables and is biholomorphic to a unit ball in C2. And you can give the biholomorphism completely explicitly. Okay, well this picture isn't completely accurate because keep in mind that the ball or the inside of the ball is really four-dimensional and so the boundary is three-dimensional and so let's zoom in and try to understand what happens if we were to look at the inside. Well, it turns out that this space is complex hyperbolic. Well, unfortunately, um, I can't draw a complex hyperbolic space. It's four-dimensional. So what I've pictured here is three-dimensional hyperbolic space, but the way that we should think about it is that there's a hidden fourth dimension that we can't see, and the curvature in the hidden dimension is four times as strong as the directions that we can see. All right. It's pretty hard to visualize complex hyperbolic geometry, so let's try to understand the geometry more symbolically. All right. For any unit vector x, we have the following expression for the curvature, r of x, jx, jxx is equal to negative 1, where j is the complex structure. And this is just another way of saying that the space has constant holomorphic sectional curvature equal to negative 1. In the language of Hessian geometry, 
the underlying Hessian manifold is said to have constant Hessian sectional curvature. There, with one catch, which is that the definition of Hessian sectional curvature has negative the sign of the holomorphic sectional curvature. So the signs are opposite, so it's a gigantic pet peeve of mine, but it is what it is, and there's nothing I can do about that. Okay, because this is a complex space form, it's possible to understand its geometry very concretely, at least as far as four-dimensional spaces go. And in particular, we have closed form expressions for the geodesics, as well as the distances between points. So we can compute these things all very concretely. Turns out that the sectional curvature is negatively quarter pinched. That's just a fact that about complex hyperbolic space. And the space is Kähler Einstein. So the Ricci tensor is proportional to the metric. Furthermore, it turns out that this metric is equivalent to the Bergman metric on the ball. So the Bergman metric is another metric which is canonical in several complex variables. And it turns out that in this case, the Kähler-Einstein metric and the Bergman metric agree with each other. And what this means also is that this metric is invariant under biholomorphic transformations. So if I take this ball and I map it to itself in a biholomorphic way, the metric is going to be preserved. And that means that we can compute the isometry group in a very explicit way. The isometry group is the six-dimensional space, um, the six-dimensional partial unitary group, and it's going to act transitively on this ball. And furthermore, it has a bunch of compact quotients. And the compact quotients essentially correspond to complex hyperbolic Kleinian groups. OK. I should mention, though, that none of these compact quotients respect the tube domain structure if we go back to the original way of thinking of this as a tube. And the reason for that is that if we had a way to do that, this would induce an affine structure on a hyperbolic surface. And it's a classic fact in affine geometry that none of the hyperbolic surfaces have affine structures. Okay. Now let's turn our attention to the primal side in terms of the natural parameters and the log partition function. So remember that the natural parameters of the normal family are the following. And what we can see from this is that eta1 can be anything. It can be positive or negative. It has, there's no restriction on it. But eta2 has got to be negative. And what that means is that the Kähler manifold that we build on the tube domain is going to be a half space in C2. And what this means also is that the two spaces, M and W, are not biholomorphic to each other. They're distinct as complex manifolds. In particular, a half space in C2 is not biholomorphic to any bounded domain. It turns out that this space has also been studied in several complex variables and also in number theory. And in number theory, it's known as the siegel jacobi space. And here's a good reference on the geometry and arithmetic of the siegel jacobi space. Turns out that the space is homogeneous and has the symmetry group SL2R, semi-direct product with R2. And this kind of makes sense, because the symmetry group of the hyperbolic half plane is SL2R. And we also have the symmetry from translating up and down in the tube domain. So it would make sense that we have this five-dimensional isometry group. One thing I should note is that in the literature, when people are studying the Siegel-Jacobi space, they often use the fact that this group has a central extension into a larger group known as the Jacobi, um, the Jacobi group. So much of the literature on the Siegel-Jacobi space actually uses this larger group instead. But one thing to note is that the symmetry group of this space, the siegel jacobi space, is five-dimensional, whereas the symmetry group of the ball is six-dimensional. And that tells us that statistical mirror symmetry does not preserve the automorphism group of the complex manifold.
Okay, and now we can start to compute the curvature of this space. It turns out that when you compute log of determinant of omega on our way to get the Ricci curvature, we get the following expression. And we can compare and contrast this with the expression for the log partition function. And doing so, this isn't a fully rigorous uh, uh, derivation, but you get the right answer from it. You can see that the Ricci form has eigenvalues 0 and negative 6. So if you do the computation in Mathematica, these are the values that you'll get. And in particular, the metric has constant scalar curvature, so it's a CSC Kähler metric. Now, by analyzing this a little bit more closely, what we'll realize is that this metric is actually a Kähler Ricci soliton. And in fact, it's actually possible to solve the Kähler Ricci flow explicitly. So we have this equation for the Kilaritzi flow where we take the metric and we evolve it in the direction of negative the Ricci curvature. And when we solve for that, we just get the following. And since it's an expanding Kilaritzi soliton, if we rescale it down so that it remains constant scalar curvature, so that the scalar curvature remains constant, we can actually solve for it explicitly. And what this is going to do is it's just going to rescale the eta 1 coordinate. So under normalized Kähler Ricci flow, the eta 1 uh, direction just gets rescaled. And it turns out that it's worth contrasting this with Kalabi Yau manifolds. So for Kalabi Yau manifolds, they're both Ricci flat, they're both Kähler Einstein. Well, in this example, W, the ball, or this tube domain, that was Killer Einstein. But the mirror to it is not Killer Einstein. It's in fact a Killer Ricci soliton. And this fact actually holds more generally. If one of the spaces is Killer Einstein, then the mirror space is going to be a Ricci soliton. And the proof of this can be found in this paper. It's phrased in terms of the Hess flow instead of Killer Ricci flow, but the result is the same. Okay, in complex geometry, there are a large number of curvatures that you could check, such as the uh, holomorphic sectional curvature, orthogonal bisectional curvature, quadratic orthogonal bisectional curvature, the list goes on and on. And for all of them that we've checked, the Siegel-Jacobi space doesn't have a sign. It's neither positive nor negative, with one exception. If we have a polarized vector, and in this context, polarized means that we have a holomorphic vector, but which points in the direction of the base. So another way of saying that is that if we use the z-coordinates of the tube domain, the coefficients on the vector are entirely real. They have no imaginary part. Well, if we have a polarized vector and another polarized vector, which is perpendicular, if we compute the following quantity, the orthogonal anti-bisectional curvature, this quantity is non-negative. And I'll discuss more on that in a little bit. Okay, let's take a step back and see what we've done thus far. If we start with the normal families, so the family of normal distributions, statistical mirror symmetry gives a duality between two classical complex surfaces which both arise as models of the hyperbolic half plane. So mirror symmetry corresponds to this duality between the two upstairs spaces. And apart from giving us a symplectomorphism between these two spaces, it's natural to ask whether there are other applications for this idea. All right, as a disclaimer, I am not a number theorist, but when you look at the literature on these spaces, you'll see that number theory tends to appear quite often. And the natural question is whether there's some connection between statistical mirror symmetry and number theory. Let me make that a little bit more precise. All right, let me tell you about modular forms. The precise definition isn't terribly important for the purposes of this talk, but the basic idea is that modular forms are these highly symmetric complex functions 
which satisfy a huge number of conditions and have a vast number of applications. So I've pictured one of them, the Ramanujan delta function. And the basic idea is that we have what's called the modular group. So we take the symmetry group of the upper half plane, which is SL2R, and then we take a co-compact uh, subgroup of that, a, a lattice within that, which we'll just use SL2Z. And a modular form of weight K is going to be a holomorphic function on the upper half plane, which satisfies the following functional equation, where Z is a point in the upper half plane, and A, B, C, D is an element of SL2Z. Well, there's one other condition I need to put on a modular form, which is that it's bounded as you go off to infinity. So here's the definition of a modular form. But there's nothing special necessarily about the upper half plane and SL2Z. We could play the same game where we take another homogeneous space and another group acting on it. So if we study the corresponding notion for the siegel jacobi space, what we get are something called Jacobi forms. And these are going to satisfy a much more complicated functional equation, which is the following. So this is quite a bit lengthier, and now we have two parameters rather than just one. And we also have a requirement on the Fourier coefficients, but we get Jacobi forms. So we get automorphic forms. And again, we can play the same game if we look at the partial unitary group. For this one, I wasn't able to find pictures of um, automorphic forms on the unit ball. They're probably a bit more difficult to visualize, but they have been studied by people in number theory quite extensively. Well, one thing that's particularly fascinating about this is that it turns out that it's possible to take modular forms so or a certain class of modular forms, so those are forms on the half space, and lift them to forms on the siegel jacobi space. In other words, given an elliptic modular form of this particular weight, we can get a Jacobi form on the siegel jacobi space. These lifts are quite difficult to construct. They're an active area of research for a long time, but here's a reference which describes how this lift happens. And so the natural question is whether there's some correspondence between the spectral data of M and the spectral data of W, which corresponds to the mirror image of this um, lift. So in other words, we have uh, some correspondence between spectral data on M hyperbolic space, that's um, non bold face M, and boldface M, the siegel jacobi space. There's a way to relate spectral data of those two spaces. And it seems too good to be a coincidence that all of these spaces just appear when you look at normal distributions. So the question is, is there some correspondence between the spectral data of hyperbolic space and the spectral data of complex hyperbolic space which mirrors these lifts on the other side. I don't have any concrete evidence for this, but it does seem too good to be a coincidence. So that's, that's the question. And more generally, are there other applications of statistical mirror symmetry to number theory or algebraic geometry? Okay. Let me give you one other application, and I'll end with this, which is Kilarity flow and anti-bisectional curvature. So as before, this is the definition of the anti-bisectional curvature, and I'm not going to discuss the original motivation for studying this quantity, which is quite a ways from the central focus of this talk. In short, the orthogonal anti-bisectional curvature plays an important role in optimal transport, and it allows us to show that certain transport maps are continuous. But 
Apart from any applications, this quantity is just a genuine curvature tensor, which is defined on a polarized manifold. The one catch is that we do need a polarization to discuss this quantity having a sign. And the reason for that is if I just take x and y to be arbitrary holomorphic vectors, and I take x and I multiply it by i, well, that just takes the anti-bisectional curvature and multiplies it by negative one. And so in order to discuss this quantity having a sign, I need to restrict myself to vectors which live in some polarization. But Sasaki metrics come with a canonical polarization, so this is okay. And what we'll notice is that with the Siegel-Jacobi space, it's a kahler ritchie soliton. So that means that non-negative anti or orthogonal anti-bisectional curvature is preserved under kahler ritchie flow for this example. Of course, it's not very interesting. All that's saying is that the geometry doesn't change. But if you have a curvature condition and you have a kahler ritchie soliton, a natural thing to do is to ask what happens to that curvature under kahler ritchie flow more generally. So Feng Ying Zhang and I decided to investigate the behavior of anti-bisectional curvature under kahler ritchie flow. And what we found is that in two dimensions, non-negative orthogonal anti-bisectional curvature, so what we have here, is preserved under kahler ritchie flow. So what that means is that if you start with an initial metric, which has non-negative orthogonal anti-bisectional curvature, then all the metrics into the future will also have non-negative orthogonal anti-bisectional curvature. And even more surprisingly, we found that if you have negative anti-bisectional curvature, so now you drop the assumption that the two polarized vectors are orthogonal to each other, you just consider arbitrary polarized vectors, and you assume that that quantity is non-positive, then that condition is preserved under kahler ritchie flow. And this result was a little bit surprising because traditionally speaking, Ritchie flow tends to favor positive curvature conditions. So if you start with a metric of, say, positive curvature operator, then for all times in the future, the metric will have positive curvature operator. And all of the other conditions which were known to be preserved under the flow, with the exception of Gaussian curvature for Riemann surfaces, well, all of the other preserved conditions were curvature positivity conditions. But what ends up happening here is that the anti-bisectional curvature is kind of a strange curvature invariant. And so it, it evolves in a way that's almost the opposite of the bisectional curvature, the holomorphic bisectional curvature. And it's that reason that its negativity is preserved under the flow when you go and you do the computation using a Hamilton maximum principle. Okay, well, let's try to find some examples of this. The most obvious example of a space with non-positive anti-bisectional curvature is W, this complex hyperbolic space. But that space is killer Einstein, so this, it's not particularly interesting to say that this metric has non-positive anti-bisectional curvature. It's just fixed under killer ritchie flow. But we can apply this general result to other spaces. And in particular, Kolabi constructed a killer Einstein metric on the tube domain over a disk which is not homogeneous. The point of his paper was to construct a kahler einstein metric which was non-homogeneous. And it turns out that when you write out kind of the most natural metric on the tube domain over a disk, so you write down the first metric that you think of, it turns out that this metric has negative anti-bisectional curvature. And so from our result on kahler ritchie flow, and some results by Fried Tong on the convergence of kahler ritchie flow to kahler einstein metrics, we immediately see that for this example that Kalabi constructed, the anti-bisectional curvature is negative, and in fact, with a little bit more careful analysis, you can show that the holomorphic sectional curvature for polarized vectors is going to be negatively pinched. 
So from these examples of killer Einstein metrics and killer Ritchie solitons, you can find associated curvature conditions and see what happens to them under killer Ritchie flow. Okay, thank you for listening. Please let me know if you have any questions, and I'll end off with putting some credits to all the artwork that I use in the talk. This video was funded in part by a collaboration grant from the Simons Foundation.